This program is made possible in part by the Maryland State Arts Council, an agency of the Department of Business and Economic Development, and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. <music> Hello, I'm Barbara Goldberg, and this is The Writing Life, and today I'm here with our guest, Joy Harjo, and she um, belongs to the Muscogee Nation, uh -huh. and uh, we're very happy to have her, and hello, Joy. Hello, and I'm really happy to be here in this beautiful Maryland. Yes, beautiful Maryland was a little bit different landscape than um, Honolulu, for instance, or Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. A little, but there are trees. <laughs> yeah. There are trees. More Not trees here. <laughs> red earth. Um, Joy Harjo is a poet with seven books of poetry, and her latest collection is um, How We Became Human. And I'm hoping that during this program we can all learn how we became human, and more importantly, how we can become human. Because apparently we're born, um, it's a journey, it's a voyage, and um, seems to be circular. Mm -hmm. And so our beginnings are very important because we kind of may wind up there and know it for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, she is a poet of witness, and the words that occur most frequently are blood, earth, mountains, sky, stars, and heart. And maybe we can begin by talking about heart because it seems to me that um, heart is the essence of being a poet. It is for some poets, I don't think for all, but for me it really I kind of begins and ends there. Actually I have a, a new poem that would actually talk about that if I can find it here. It's called, a, it was one morning I got up with in a mess, you know, yeah. about somebody I perceived as an enemy. Oh, that's good. Yes, and, and you know, poetry deals with all sorts of uh, things. And I was thinking, well, how do I handle this? How do I, and I, I realized that massacres and any, any destruction, the things that we do to each other, all people do to each other, usually comes out of reason. You can reason yourself into any place. But I wrote this one, it's like, today I pray for my enemies. Hmm. But now I'm going to have to find it, and we can keep talking. <laughs> well, let me Here just say that it seems to me, and you've said this too, that poetry, your con your poetry is like a force field. Mm -hmm. And you've often said that you enter your poetry by horseback, you go into it by horseback, which is very different from um, a tradition of meaning and significance in verbal ways, mm -hmm. and that you're articulating from... Um, a subterranean region, something that's not altogether conscious, which is why these words, uh, stars, mountain, carry a, a, a big significance. Yeah, I'm usually taken in. I think that all poems are little force fields or little houses, and I figure if I can build it nice enough that a spirit, you know, that the spirit of poetry will come and live in it, because words are vibration. We're making, we're making our presidency, we're making our country, we're making our in you know, our lives, our paths, we're all making our paths with our words, with how we speak to each other and with how we, um, you know, treat each other. It's all part of that similar kind of thing. And poetry is such a distilled language. So this, that's why I wrote this morning, I pray for my enemies, because I don't want to get entangled in more mess. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't want, I, I want to find a way of, of clarity to work through very chaotic, you know, human situation. So this one addresses the heart, and I didn't know where this poem is going to go. I don't know where they're going to go. It's well, not. Well, do you ever? <laughs> no, I don't think anybody does. Even yeah. if you're writing formulaic stuff, you don't. You know, the, you might have the formula, the, the formula there, but it's a, it's really, it's, it's discovery. It's like a life too. A life is about discovery. You don't always know. You're always making choices. And you're always listening. It, to me, it's it's about listening. It's it's 
writing a poem is about listening. And uh, it's interesting you say listening because it also seems to me that in a sense the enemy is also silence because in silence, I'm not saying listening, but in silence that's where fear comes, that's when anger comes un mm -hmm. until you can have the words be like the stars. Yeah, yeah. So here's this, this, this morning I pray for my enemies. And whom do I call my enemy? An enemy must be worthy of engagement. I turn in the direction of the sun and keep walking. It's the heart that asks the question, not my furious mind. The heart is the smaller cousin of the sun. It sees and knows everything. It hears the gnashing even as it hears the blessing. The door to the mind should only open from the heart. An enemy who gets in then risks the danger of becoming a friend. Who? Oh. See, I had no idea it was going to wind up mm. there. <laughs> That's lovely. I yeah. mean, risks mm -hmm. is uh, an interesting word choice there. It's kind of defanged mm -hmm. once it's let in. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if I can ask you to read the poem I love so much, which sort of seems connected to this, I Give You Back. Mm -hmm. That is one of my oldest poems, and it's a poem that was a gift to me because it was something that I needed as a young writer, as somebody really getting going. I didn't come to poetry naturally. I, I started out, I love singing and songwriting. It's, it's related. My mother loved to write songs, and I think that's what she passed on to me. And songs, for me, songs and poetry are synonymous. I should mention that uh, Joy has, performs with a band, mm -hmm. and it's called um, Arrow, Arrow Dynamics, and um, that she plays the saxophone, and today maybe she'll play the flute for us, and you can hear that another kind of voice but for joy, music and song and dance and poetry are intermingled and there's no firm boundary uh, between any of them. And one last thing is that joy started off as a visual artist mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that later. They're really all connected. I think it's in uh, this, this society that separates, that tends to separate, but they all came into the world together. So anyway, I, when I started writing poetry, I was a reluctant poet. I loved reading poetry. I loved music. I loved singing. But, um, and I loved Emily Dickinson. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I started poetry, I told poetry, no, no, leave me alone. I want to be an artist. I'm an you know, art major, and this is what I want to do. But poetry said, you know, you really need to learn how to listen. And you need to learn how to speak, because I always sat in the back of the classroom and didn't say anything. Hmm. And I was coming, it was during a time of movements for Native rights and, and there was a lot that needed to be spoken. And I'm not the only one, there were many given that assignment. And I believe that every family has one. You're probably the one in your family. The witness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the witness right. of sort of the yeah. one who talks, the one yeah. who speaks. And, and so I was appointed that, and I was reluctant. I did not want to. But this poem came about, and it was given to me to release any, any of that fear, any, anything like that. And the poem has served me well over the years, since the 70s. And I get a lot of emails and letters from people saying this poem saved their life. So it's been useful. It was a gift to me, and it was, you know, it's gone out to other people. I mean, they come through. It doesn't mean... I just, they just come and I write them down, but I work on these. It's like yeah. the person making this flute worked on it. A poem, you work on poems like that too. You know, you have to sand and, and <laughs> chip away and move words around to make the place. But the spirit of it, I hear a lot of carvers say, well, I had this piece of wood, it looked, you know, a block of wood, but then I saw something in it, or it, it saw me, and we began a conversation. I think one of the most beautiful and fulfilling things about poetry is ending up someplace you never expected to. Um, maybe that's the clarity mm -hmm. you're talking about. Um, it's something you get swept up in the in the in the process, and mm -hmm. not knowing where you're going is one of the most satisfying <laughs> feelings. Yeah, yeah. So this one, I don't even remember exactly what started it, but there it was. 
I release you, my beautiful and terrible fear, I release you. You are my beloved and hated twin, but now I don't know you as myself. I release you with all the pain I would know at the death of my children. You are not my blood anymore. I give you back to the soldiers who burned down my home, beheaded my children, raped and sodomized my brothers and sisters. I give you back to those who stole the food from our plates when we were starving. I release you fear because you hold these scenes in front of me and I was born with eyes that can never close. I release you, I release you, I release you, I release you. I am not afraid to be angry. I am not afraid to rejoice. I am not afraid to be black. I am not afraid to be white. I am not afraid to be hungry. I am not afraid to be full. I am not afraid to be hated. I am not afraid to be loved. To be loved. To be loved. Fear. Oh, you've choked me, but I gave you the leash. You have gutted me, but I gave you the knife. You have devoured me, but I laid myself across the fire. I take myself back, fear. You are not my shadow any longer. I won't hold you in my hands. You can't live in my eyes, my ears, my voice, my belly, or my heart. My heart. My heart. My heart. But come here, fear. I am alive, and you are so afraid of dying. Hmm. That's um, another quality of your work, which is, and again, which differs from what I would call contemporary American poetry, and that is the urge to balance polarities or to unite mm -hmm. polarities in some way, paradox. And uh, I, what I like so much about that poem, it's almost as though fear is the frightened child at the end there and that you encompass it, and by encompassing it, well, you become more human. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to think about with that. Um, I mentioned that you have a band, mm -hmm. and that you like to perform, and that music is central to your work, and I'm hoping that you can treat us to, let's say, a poem with your flute. Okay. Let's see, which one will Merge. I do? I'll do emergence and I'll play a little bit for that. This poem is written. We all have uh, time. There's moments. There's pivotal moments. We are, we're always making choices in our lives. When we get up in the morning, <laughs> am I going to get up or not? Or <laughs> am I going to get up on the wrong side of the bed or <laughs> or whatever? But this one, I wound up in L.A. and I always said, oh, I'll never live in L.A. It's going to fall into the ocean. And I figured now if it does, it will be um, bad movies that finally are the final <laughs> trigger, <laughs> you know, not earthquakes. But um, so then I wound up living in a little place momentarily right off Hollywood Boulevard, a whole different world. And, and um, this was about that. It was a summer night and listening. I was listening to the immigrants who were living around in the apartment building who had also said, I will never move to L.A. And never is a very powerful word. You can, it's one of the most powerful words in the world because you will most certainly do what you say you will never do. Because it's magnetic, I think. Intensity is magnetic. Right. So if you say, I won't do something, and you do it with, say it with an intensity, it do, the intensity doesn't hear not. It just hears the Go image. for it. Yeah. <laughs> That's, at least that's my theory of how it works now. So here we are in L.A., downtown in the summer, and you hear the Spice Girls going up the Hollywood Boulevard in a double-decker bus, and then there's somebody lonely in the, <laughs> somebody in one of the little, little um, rooms thinking about home and the, watching the sun go down.
It's midsummer night. The light is skinny. A thin skirt of desire skims the earth. Dogs bark at the musk of other dogs and the urge to go wild. I'm lingering at the edge of a broken heart, striking relentlessly against the flint of hard will. It's coming apart. Everyone knows it. So do squash erupting in flowers the color of the sun. So does the momentum of grace gathering allies in the partying mob. The heart knows everything. I remember when there was no urge to cut the earth or each other into pieces when we knew how to think in beautiful. There is no world like the one surfacing. I can smell it as I pace in my square room. The neighbor's television entering my house by waves of sound makes me think about buying a new car, another kind of cigarette when I don't need a new car and I don't even smoke cigarettes. <laughs> A human mind is small when thinking of small things. It is large when embracing the maker of walking, thinking, and flying. If I can locate the sense beyond desire, I will not eat or drink until I stagger into the earth with grief. I will locate the point of dawning and awaken with the longest day in the world. I'm thinking... Um how community, the company of um, like-minded people in a way, has so often saved you from that feeling of isolation, say, in a foreign culture. And because we were talking beforehand about outrigger canoes mm -hmm. and your love of being strong mm -hmm. and paddling, mm -hmm. if you could talk a little about um, what you feel when you're out there in the water in a community of um, paddlers, I guess. Yeah, I'm the kind of person, that's a good question, because I'm a paradox of sorts, and, and my poems are marked by paradox, where I'm very rooted in my Muscogee culture. That's the heart and soul, it's, it's there. Yet, I find my home and cultures all over the world, I find my place. I don't feel comfortable I don't feel, I've never felt like I've had an absolute home here on this earth, and mm -hmm. yet this earth so much informs it, home. I mean, I can find home taking a little walk by the conservancy. I can find home in the flight of a dragonfly, or in my dream world is really where I find my home, and yet in other, you know, I find home in the ocean. I am an outrigger canoe paddler. I find a lot of connections between Hawaiian paddlers and, and writers and myself, but I've also found connections with Stanley Kunich, Kunich, mm. <laughs> Kunich up yeah. here and with other people from all over with, um, you know, in poems. I can find my home in a poem or in somebody's, in meeting somebody in the airport and sitting and visiting with somebody who's taking care of a, a baby, you know. It's, it's the home. I think that's what I've had to learn and is you know, is, is that my home, it's in here. Hmm. It's in here, and, and it's, um, you know, the root is in, in with my tribe, with the language, and even as much as I've run away from everybody, I always come back. I'm remembering something um, Stanley Kunitz said, which is uh, that poems have to come from, like, under the water, and it's like you pull them up with all the muck and the goo of the, you know, of the brambles and all that that's underwater. And if it's skimming the surface, it's less satisfying. I kind of have, I never thought of that before, but mm -hmm. it's kind of like you're, you're pulling something up or out um, that's, that's given voice to. So I find that really interesting. I wonder if you could read... Uh, perhaps one of your prose poems that has to do with that sense of home. Um, what was the one about the Red Mountains, the first? Mm, let's see. What is, my house is a red earth? Yeah. Okay. This, this piece is, it's, it, it is, uh, little, they're little prose, poetic prose pieces, I call them, uh, that I wrote for a book that is a collaboration with a photographer, Stephen mm. Strom. Mm. 
And I'm about to do my own book of photographs with, with prose. I also have been photographing, and I'm um, working on that also. But this one is to give back. The piece is actually to give back and to say thank you to the, this land that gives us so much but asks for very little from mm. humans. So I'll just read a few parts of that. My house is the red earth. It could be the center of the world. I've heard New York, Paris, Tokyo called the center of the world. But I say, it's magnificently humble. You could drive by and miss it. Radio waves can obscure it. Words cannot construct it. For there are some sounds left to sacred wordless form. For instance, that fool crow picking through trash near the corral understands the center of the world as greasy scraps of fat. Just ask him. He doesn't have to say that the earth has turned scarlet through fierce belief. After centuries of heartbreak and laughter, he perches on the blue bowl of the sky and laughs. We love that crow. Yeah. As a contrast. They're uh, always doing studies on human behavior. That's what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah, they're, they're involved in studies. They're reporting back. To? to the creator of all of us. <laughs> now, you have um, a poem which mentions the breath maker. Mm -hmm. Who is the creator? Well, of? in the Muskogee, that's, there's actually a word that we don't say out loud much, but is the creator of all. And it's the same of all. It, we all go back to the same place. Breath maker is Hasagara Masi. And when the Christians came, they linked on, it's, you know, and that he's, he, she, it's not a he, it's, there's no, that being is the one who is in charge of breath, which is so important to humans and to our create, you know, our existence. We, when we take our first breath, it's a promise. It's a promise to take it on. Say, we're going to take on it. We're going to take on our part of the story. In the Hebrew language, this is really interesting. The same word is soul and breath. Uh huh. Kind of uh, a wind that comes yeah. in, and also. The name Abel in Cain and Abel uh -huh. means wet breath. Well, of course, he gets knocked off pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he was the one who knew what kind of gift uh -huh. to give to the to the Creator, and that's something um, I'd like to come back to too, which is a sense of the sacred, mm -hmm. of reverence. Um, but on something you you write later on, you talk about saint coincidence. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in? That just came about, you never know, that poem is very much a story that's kind of based on the, the, uh, the Seneca creation story, the woman who fell from the sky. And um, so I wind up with this story, and I don't even know what set it off, of a woman falling from the sky and landing in the Safeway. <laughs> you know, and, Good place. Yeah, <laughs> and same coincidence was part of that whole, you know, <laughs> it was part of the winding around. Well, that's the other thing, food. It's almost like uh, food brings us back to the things of this world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you are someplace sacred or holy, and then you walk to the refrigerator, or you have a cup of coffee, and that kind of is a transition into the everyday world. I'm wondering if in your real life, your real life, whatever is real, that the border how, how does that work in everyday life, the border between that other world, the deeper world, the more human world, and our everyday world? How does that... Do you I travel back and forth many times a day? I do, and I think I always go back to being a child because when mm -hmm. I was a child I could see and move between the worlds in a much more fluid manner. And I mark the day that I went to school and was taught not to know those things it was a big shift was a huge shift and I have spent poetry for me was a way of of honoring and getting back to that kind of movement and travel between what is called dreams which may be our real world if you think about mm -hmm. it you know when we we're all going to die eventually everyone and what are we going to we're going to be in that dream world that's the more real it, that's if you think about it that's absolutely it's the, there uh, it is. center of your universe and actually this is a good place to come to a close because you mentioned childhood and uh, uh -huh. that's something you knew in childhood it almost it's like an up we forgot as up we grew or something like that that there's some kind of relationship that is certain and known and intuitive at that point and that we kind of need to come back to mm -hmm. and uh, do we have time for another 
brief flute song. Oh, we'd love to hear that. Okay. I'm going to sing a morning song in Creek, and then um, let's see. Hadhayaga ega na mahalejas, aga lechga ida gale, hadhayaga di leche a chungas. Heth lusad mo ida hoje, oba funga la fan we jalisa chungaras, chep in godly goes, chep in godly goes. The red dawn now is rearranging the earth. Thought by thought, Beauty by beauty, each sunrise a link on the ladder. Thought by thought, beauty by beauty, the ladder, the backbone of shimmering deity. Thought by thought, beauty by beauty, child stirring in the web of your mother. Don't be afraid, old man turning to walk through the door. Don't be afraid. Now the flute's in a different key, but I can go for it. been here today with Joy Harjo, who is has many projects mm -hmm. for the future. She is uh, going to be writing her memoir, or maybe you're deep in process, mm -hmm. and children's story, mm -hmm. and giving a huge performance in what city in California? In L.A. In L.A. A one-woman <laughs> show, and then I've got a new CD of music with some of the songs from that show. Right. Uh -huh. So we're privileged to have Joy here today, and uh, privilege to learn some ways, some paths we can follow to become more human. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much.